Um, so this is where we can pick up the slides. So I'm going to leave that one up quickly, and we have one at the end as well. So you can pick this, the slides up from our website as well as some of the other blog posts that we have around this particular interesting topic. So this is what we're going to go through today. We have an introduction, more, more likely about who we are, what we do. Then we're going to talk about the different data formats to a point. I'm not going to go into any, really any depth into them, because if for a 35-minute talk, you really can't get into too much depth. But we're going to cover the, the majority of them. Then we're going to, Sylvie's going to take you through how to choose them. And we've actually done some benchmarking on some of these. Um, the thing I'd like to point out straight off the bat is we did this about a year ago. And we haven't got back to it as a consulting company. We have clients, and unfortunately, sometimes our clients get in the way of us doing the really interesting work. I can't really say that my salesperson's in the room. But we will get back to that. It's some stuff that we want to talk about. Then I want to get into the idea of schema evolution and then storage choices, which is mainly around things like, do I use direct storage? Do I use object stores? Am I in the cloud? What do I do? And how does that affect? And then obviously some questions at the end. So let me start with some introductions. So we're a boutique data science, data engineering uh, consulting company based in Mountain View, but we have offices in Chicago, Bentonville, Arkansas, and London, as well as people dotted around the, the country. We're about 65 to 70 people in total. So these are some of our, um, how we want to put it. Um, our thoughts of the thoughts, mission statement, vision statement, as it were. You know, we work as cross-functional teams between data engineering and data science. So I'm the VP of data engineering. There is a VP of data science who's my counterpart. We have engineering teams and data science teams, but we actually work really well together, and we work as a blended team for our clients. So we use agile software development approaches. We make rapid progress against difficult problems and require flexibility. But the really important one in there is we want to get to business value as quickly as possible, hence the agile methodology around it, to iterate towards the larger goal. So the idea is we won't come in and say, hey, that's going to take six months. At the end of six months, we show you something. It's every two weeks, we'll show you something and pivot from there. But that's enough about what we do as Silicon Valley data science. Let's get into the, the meat of the matter, the data formats. So this is a little timeline. Um, I actually spent some time trying to find out when these actually happened. So we reckon around 2006, and I think it may have been a little bit before this, because I was working at Yahoo when Doug Cutting and those guys were there doing Hadoop, was when text files and sequence files came into use within the platform. Then around 2008, we had RC files. Then 2009, we have Avro files, obviously coming out of Doug Cutting and all those guys uh, looking at Avro. Probably a lot of it came from what Google was doing and what Facebook was doing as well. And then in 2013, as Julian was up here, he's the, uh, I guess, the father of Parquet. So we have Parquet and then um, Owen O'Malley over at Hortonworks was doing ORC as well. So we've seen a, a change of where things are going. And then the other one is, is where is the future going? I know there was uh, probably possibly some talks around um, Arrow as well, which is kind of an interesting concept and in how that kind of fits into this ecosystem too. So let's get to text. So basically, text files are anything that's human readable, right? So some CSV files back in my day, CSV files back in my day. That's what I always in, in, you know, pulled into Oracle way back when, TSV, JSON when it comes around. We just had a client where we were pulling in a massive XML file. Um, and I forgot how XML was absolutely a nightmare. But we, we did it. So these are different formats, really easy to read, easy to exchange. The main thing is it's human readable. So I can just pull it up and read it and like, oh, yeah, that looks right. That doesn't look right. But these data stores are bulky and inefficient to query. All right? We can use potentially things like Apache Drill to query XML and JSON files. But iBoys are kind of bulky to query. But they don't support block compression. You can compress the file, but when I want to pull that into Hadoop, it has to kind of read it and then decompose itself and then push it up all to all the mappers. If I'm doing something like a, a Hive query, or in some cases in Parler where I want to move things around. Then we had sequence files that came out. So it came out at the same time. So this is a binary file. 
you know, key value pairs, it's, ro it's still row based, we're still on the row based thing, we haven't hit the columnar yet. Columnly, 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 columnly used um, mainly between MapReduce jobs. So this was the idea that if I've got a MapReduce job and these things are talking to each other, we may pull in text files initially, but then the communication between these things would actually be sequence files. Mainly because it can handle the block compression and I can actually separate these files and it's in a binary format and it's obviously a lot faster. And as I said before, it, su it supports splitting even when the data is compressed. So if I've got a compressed sequence files, I'm pulling it into a MapReduce job or a, I guess a Hive query, Impala, etc. It can split them up and then give them to the right data nodes to actually do the query pieces on those data nodes and kind of assemble the contents back together again. Look at Avro. Avro, um, hopefully Julian's not in the room, is actually one of my favorites. Um, I really like Avro. Um, use it a lot in civilization. If anyone's being using Confluent or Kafka and using Confluent and using uh, schema registry, that's all in Avro. I like the idea that I can describe the schema. I've got schema evolution, which we'll come on to later. I just, it's actually really nice, but the problem is it, and we'll see shortly, it doesn't perform particularly well anymore. Um, the cool thing is the schema is encoded in the file, which is great, so I can actually look at the file to see what the schema is. Does this, does support block compression and splittable, and like I said before, it does have schema evolution. And we've got a little section on schema evolution as well, which is from an old database guy, I love schema evolution. Right, Parquet, and I think Julian's in the room, so if I get something wrong, he can't tell me off. So now we get into the columnar oriented data stores, uh, data files, right? So it's a binary one. We've got use record treading assembly algorithms described in the Dremel paper. So perfect. Each data file consists of values for a set of rows. Efficiency in terms of IO, which is actually really important. But the main one is, a lot of this is it's columnar based. So when you have a really, really wide table, which Sylvia will get to in a minute, whereas that's where it comes into its it, it's a case of why you would want to use it. And in some cases, you kind of use it all the time. But not to steal Sylvia's thunder. Then we have optimized row columnar, or I will call it ORC from now on. Um, it's the evolution of the RC, the RC file, as well as like Parquet, it also is columnar. Um, the other one as well it has is a really good compression algorithm. Um, it actually compresses a lot better when we were looking at this a year and a half ago, better than Parquet was. So if storage is an issue, ORC files are really good to compress. Um, the other one as well, it does come with some basic stats on the columns, like min, max, sum, and count within the file, which is kind of interesting, um, which Parquet at the time doesn't do. Um, and again, as we get into doing a, new, a newer version of this, we look at the newer versions of Parquet, for instance. But again, suitable for parallel processing uh, row collection. Now with saying that, I'm gonna pass over to Sylvia, who's gonna get into the meat of the, the details. Um, what, she's gonna walk, what she's gonna do is actually walk through some of the um, testing or benchmarking that we did on these different formats using different query engines, and in some cases also different ecosystems as well. So Sylvia. Thank you, Steven. Okay, so I think this is the fun part, at least for me, is uh, how do you choose which data format to use? And it changes a lot depending on if you're starting or if you already have like all your data lake and everything. So I'm gonna start with, there's no universal answer. There's no single answer I'm gonna give you. You're gonna be like, oh yeah, I need to use that one. So instead I'm gonna give you a framework and I'm gonna give you questions that you can ask yourself so you can choose what's best for your own data platform. So let's start with what we talk the functional requirements are, which are just the basics. Let's talk about what type of data do you have? Like, are you pulling your data from an application? Do you have log files, which is what Steven was talking about, CSVs? Um, so it depends what kind of data you have, and then what kind of, then the next question is like, what kind of tools do you have that you already know you're gonna use uh, 
Hadoop cluster. So you know you want to use Hive and Impala. So do they support the data format that you want to use? Um, we'll see in the next slide exactly which query engines support which data formats. Um, another question that you might ask yourself is like, what about my data sizes? Do I have lots of little files? Do I have lots of big files? Am I concerned about the space in my cluster and other things? And the last one, again, Stephen already talked about a little bit about this, is schema evolution. Am I worried that my data is going to change over time? So, for example, you have an app and you are downloading the files from the app, but then you know next month your app might change and might add a new field. How is that going to play around with what you had already? So, how do you reconcile what you, your data used to look like to data that has a new column and so on? And then, I'm going to talk about how do you choose files for writing use cases and reading use cases. So let's first let, take a look about the query engines and which data formats they support. And of course, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just a list that we have right now. So right now, Hive supports all the data formats that we talk about, uh, text, sequence, abrupt, arcan, or RC. Uh, let's see at Impala. Impala doesn't support ORC. So this is a perfect example where you're like, oh, I want to use ORC, but then you cannot cure it if you're planning to use an Impala. So that might influence your decision. Uh, for Drill, um, the main ones are text and parquet, and the other ones, you can read the other text formats, but they are not fully supported. Uh, Spark SQL can read everything right now, and then Presto uh, doesn't have full support for Abra right now. OK, so let's move into the use cases about how do you choose a data format when writing data is your main concern. Uh, so again, this fits a little bit with what I was talking about, the functional requirements, which is, um, are you concerned about the speed? Are you concerned about the memory? Are you concerned about the schema evolution? Uh, what about per uh, can you parse the data, or is the data easily inspectable? Uh, so if you have a lot of analysts that just want to go and look at the data, like they probably want to see text, right? They don't want to have to use a query engine to be able to translate what they see on the file. So what we did, um, and this is the fun part, is we run a bunch of tests. Um, I don't want to call them benchmarks because we use different systems and each system has a different footprint. So one cluster was smaller than the other. Uh, but we came up with two sets of data, uh, so two data sets. The first one is what we call our narrow data set, which is 10 million rows and only 10 columns. So this is kind of like similar what an Apache log look like. Uh, so when you want to go and visit a website, um, it records all your information. And then we have a, what we call a wide data set, which is 4 million rows, and this one has 1,000 columns. So think about you're pulling some user data and then you're saving choices. So 1,000 columns of just user choices or user data. Um, it's important to add that for most of our data formats, we compress them using Snappy. Except for Abra, we were also trying deflate. So if there's a label in our graphs that says deflate, then you know that's, that's the only one that we try both of them for now. Okay. So um, for the read test, we only use Hive. And we're using two distributions of Hadoop. One of them is Cloudera, and the other one is Hortonworks. All right, so let's start with Hortonworks, which had Hive 0.14 at the time that we did the tests. And this is just measuring the grinding speed. So you have your time, and then your uh, data format. So on the left side is the narrow one. And you can see text and sequence write pretty fast, and all the other formats are a little bit slower. Um, this is because they have to start doing all the formats. For example, in a columnar format, you will have to separate the columns and write in different blocks. Um, we have a kind of like a cool diagram in our website that shows you how the data formats are written in blocks. So if you want to look at that later, it's cool. Um, Just to add on to that one. Uh, Sylvia is even we got the timing here we actually have done this with other clients as well and what we actually see is the graphs look the same 
So regardless of the size of cluster and how long it took, the actual graphs looked the same. So obviously text is always the fastest, send sequence files, and then it becomes uh, Avro, then it's basically Parquet and ORC, and it's, it kind of looks like that across the board. It's a very interesting, if you just took the time away, or even say how big the data sets were, within reason you need at least something that's uh, you know, in, the, in the terms of gigabytes uh, and hundreds of them, but the actual graphs would look exactly the same. Yeah, and to that point, if we move on to the Cloudera distribution, again, it's different system, different sizing of the system, but the graph pretty much looks the same. Um, when it's an arrow data set, there's not much difference, but when you're starting to use wider, wider data sets, just when you say the pronounced difference. Um, so that's in terms of speed. What about size? How much size do these data formats take on my system? Um, this is the cool part, so as we know, columnar formats are being are able to compress very well. Especially, that's also going to depend. This ratio is going to depend on the kinds of data that your columns are storing. So, for example, if a lot of your columns are just booleans or integers, they're going to be able to compress more than if they have like text or a bar chart or something like that. So, these ratios actually vary depending on your data, but. Text and sequence files are very bulky. They take the most space when you store them in your system. Um, Avro is in the middle of the pack, but then again, Parquet and ORC compress really well. ORC a little bit better than Parquet, but that's okay. okay. So we're gonna move to, well, let's just recap what I just talked about. So in terms of grinding, when do you choose to use text? Okay, you choose to use text when you want to write your data really fast and when you want to make it parsable by anybody. Like anybody can just come and take a look at the file and open it and see what's going on. A uh, sequence file, we only recommend it if you're really still doing MapReduce jobs. As Steven said, it's like the transition between one MapReduce job and the other one. Um, Abra, we recommend when there's a schema evolution and the columnar formats like Parquet on RC, uh, we'll see about this because right now you saw that they compress very well, they take a little bit longer to write, but there's gonna be a trade-off. Everything's like a trade-off in the data world. Uh, so while well, they took longer to write, they compress better, and they're gonna be faster to read, which is what we're gonna look at. Uh, our news, next use case, that is how do you choose your data format when you're more concerned about getting results faster? Okay, so again, we start with uh, what are concerns. Um, I think there's different types of queries that you can run in a system. So some of them are very uh, specific columns, like I want to know um, demographics, or I want to know a specific thing about a user. So they are very targeted. You only look at a certain columns for each record. And then there's queries where you're like, give me all the data for this user or for this set of users. So you're looking at two completely different things. So we're gonna see in the next graphs that's like the trade-off where the read performance is better, even though the files took longer to write. So again, we have our data sets that we are testing. So we have the same ones, the narrow data set, the wide data set, but this time we wanted to push the limits a little bit more and we enlarged the wide data set. So it's still a thousand columns, but we ran it as long as to create like one terabyte of data. So that's what we're gonna be curing. And again, everything is compressed using Snappy uh, and then except for Abra, which we do Snappy and Deflight. So this time we're using Hive to Curie, Impala, and we're using Spark. And this time our systems are, we use a Cloudera distribution of Hadoop, and we use Amazon EMR. And it's important, like we mentioned, what type of query are you running? So we run four types of queries. The first one is just a regular count. Um, the second one is like a query that had five conditions or five word clauses for different columns. The third query is 10 conditions and the fourth query is 20 conditions. Okay, so let's start with the Cloudera distribution and start looking at Hive, which is kind of like the baseline for a lot of things. So when you have your narrow data set, 
everything looks kind of like clumped together. There's not a clear difference on which data format is better, except for Abra Deflate, which is not performing so hot compared to the other ones. Um, and at the beginning, we were like, well, this is not what we expected. This is not what we saw in previous versions of Hive. So it's something that we wanted to, we put on hold to go and investigate at a later date. The other one to add on this one is query one isn't on there because for every single format or data format that we had, because it was running in this version of Hive, is it would get the count regardless, and it was already cached. So it was always like zero seconds. It come back pretty much immediately. That's why it's not on this particular chart. Uh, so now let's move to our, our data sets. So let's look at the white data set. And this is where you start seeing the difference in performance between the da different data formats. So your columnar formats are much faster at curing when there's a specific conditions, right? So RC, Parquet, then you have sequence tags, and again, Abro is kind of like the awkward child right now that is not performing so hot. And then when we move to our one terabyte data set, that's when you really see like a difference. And the scale sometimes is kind of like misleading, but Avra took like four times as long as to query that an ORC or upper K file. And even text took well like 3,000 seconds as opposed to 1,000 seconds. Um, so next one, we're going to look at the same results in Impala. Um, first, you'll notice that there's no ORC, because as you saw on the previous slide, Impala doesn't support ORC. So we're only using the other data formats. And again, this is the narrow data set, so we only have 10 columns. So the difference is not that great. So Parquet is still fast. Um, but same as Avro and the sequence files. Tax is slower, regardless. And um, the Avro deflate is still misbehaving. The other thing to add on here as well, that um, from a columnar format, as you see with Parquet on this particular one, is the time goes up. So you go from no queries to five, the amount of time goes from one, less than one second to like 1.8 seconds, and then go to the, the 10 conditions, it goes up to uh, just over two seconds. And the same on the sequence file, which is interesting, because I would expect that to be more level, because it still has to read pretty much all the columns regardless. Um, the average snap is an interesting one, where the one with five conditions was actually took longer than the one with 10 conditions. Now, by the way, we actually averaged this, I think we did like 10 20 runs of this to get the averages out. And we also kind of think, did things like shut down the clusters to make sure we didn't have any, basically any caching going on, either at the file system level or actually within Hadoop as well. So we wanted to make sure it was kind of clean as much as possible. But there were some interesting things that we, we definitely saw on here um, compared to one that I will show later on. But carry on, Sylvia. Yeah. OK, so now again, when we start looking at the white data set, this is when Parquet starts to shine, right? Um, you can see there's like clear difference where it performs better than all the other formats, just because we're limiting, we're using the advantages of looking at a specific columns. And like Steven mentioned, still kind of like an increasing, the more conditions, the more time it takes, and that's kind of like expected. And our super large data set, again, like, Parquet, Chine, um, in everything. There was a weird bump for Abro deflate now that we couldn't really <laughs> explain. Um, but everything else is kind of like what we expected, where Abro is now performing in the middle of the pack, which is what we wanted at some point. And then the text and the sequence are not performing so hot. So now let's take a look at, again, Hive, but this time in an Amazon EMR. Uh, because different Cladera distri uh, Hadoop distributions use, have different enhancements in some of their curing tools. Okay, so again, we start with our narrow data set, and this looks again very like compressed and like everything. There's like a little bit difference, but not too much. And in fact, in this one, that was funny that text and sequence were faster than all the other ones which is different what we saw before in another Hadoop distribution. And then this is our white data set, but then again, 
now that we have more columns, we see again what we expect that our column, our fo file formats are shiny, and everything else is pretty much the same. And yeah, before you move, Sylvia, so this is the interesting one is because we had used different versions of Hive, it acted with Avro very differently. Um, and this is one of the things that I will also reiterate at the end as well is every time you get a new version, you've got to run the test again. Because what you thought was what was going on in one version, when you change the versions between, um, say, for instance, your, your Hadoop distro or your version of Avro, and potentially some storage pieces, it changes dramatically. And we saw this definitely on Avro. I remember having a discussion once with a Hive committer about why this is, and he had some thoughts around they, weren't, they were probably not optimizing for Avro because people, things like ORC and Parquet came along, and they started optimizing for that and changing it, which caused a problem with Avro. So when you have clients that are using, when we have clients that are using Avro and they're going to newer versions, we kind of say, okay, we may make, may make sense now to actually change that to a new version because all of a sudden you're going to see a latent, you know, your queries are going to increase in time, which may, you know, may not meet your SLAs that you have with, your, uh, with the business or the clients. Yeah, so that's something we like to do. We like to experiment and we like to test. Um, so again, this is Spark, and this was uh, as of last year, so it's still Spark 1.6, and this is one of the ones that we really want to update now with Spark 2 and Spark 2.1. Um, and this is actually one of our colleagues around this test. His name is Andrew Ray. He's a Spark contributor. Um, so he helped us run all this test, and we'll see ourselves. So first, again, we start with our narrow data set, so only 10 columns. And in this case, you know how we didn't show the query one for high because it optimizes for that. So that's not the case in Spark. Um, so Spark, even for a query with no conditions, with just a count, you are still seeing difference within the data formats. Um, everything's increasing depending on the number of conditions. But again, Parquet really shine uh, with Spark. And then Avro is still kind of like slow. The other thing to add in here um, is the, I think at the time we were using Spark, the ORC driver, so Parquet is a first class citizen in Spark, ORC isn't, it's actually going through some, some bits in Hive. So it's kind of expected. Um, it's got more, potentially more code paths to go through to pull the data in in ORC than it does with Parquet, which was an insight that we saw straight away. Like, well, I remember asking Andrew, why, why is that the case? And he went, actually went through the Spark code and said, yeah, the code paths are very different. Um, Parquet is a first class citizen in, in Spark. Uh, so moving on to our wide data set, um, and this is like where it starts becoming a little bit funny, which we're talking about the ORC and the Parquet, because now we have more columns, they, obviously are faster than the other data formats. But the interesting part here was that that first point for ORC, where it takes way longer than everything else, that's something that I think Andrew was looking at at some point and probably fell off track. And then, again, our large data set, this was um, Andrew playing around with this, and he was trying Spark Mem, which caches uh, some of the data in the memory, so it's supposed to be faster. Um, so it's faster even than using like the columnar data format. Um, this is something I'm excited to see in the future because there's like the same thing with Arrow, right? It's gonna be able to cache data or like use the columnar formats on memory. Um, that's gonna speed up a lot of things. So that's something for the future that's interesting. So I think I'll leave you this to so, Yeah, so a lot of what uh, Sylvia did it actually came from a client and I'm gonna put this up on the screen. This was probably a few years ago now. We had a, an older version of the Hadoop ecosystem as well as, um, as well as versions of things like Parquet, Avro, et cetera. And this is where we thought Avro deflate would actually be really interesting. So this is a customer, they're coming from an Oracle database. They wanna do queries. And at the moment with Oracle, they only can limit themselves to five conditions. Then you can query on five things, that's how many indexes they wanted to create on those conditions, 
because they needed speed to come through. So marketing to basically do things like um, taking demographic and geographic and defining, hey, uh, is this household, what's its propensity to buy a car? Do they have animals? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? How many children do they have? So basically a marketing company for a uh, cable advertising. And they were moving to a way like, we want to query a lot faster than we can do in, in Oracle. We want to move to the uh, Hadoop type infrastructure because we want to bring on more clients. So we actually ran a test. Um, actually, I ran the test on this one. And it was actually fun to do. Actually, coding for a VP of engineering is always fun. Um, and I ran it for every single uh, combination of um, data file with compression. We were using Impala for the whole thing, so that's why ORC is in there. So we did the compression, like as we imagine, the text uncompressed and the Avro uncompressed, and the sequence uncompressed was actually quite high. The other things that we noticed as well is regardless of number of conditions, things like SQL snappy text, um, Avro deflate were pretty much the same all the time. So regardless of how many conditions I had, it was level set all the time. And then we pulled in Parquet, and, we, and you can see what it's doing. Obviously, being a col columnar format, every condition or field I added, the latency went up, which is kind of what we expected. Um, I remember showing this to the client, and we ran the query, and the query came back for, it was five conditions. The query comes back in like seven seconds. And they like the first thing they say is, wow, but you obviously canned that. And we said, OK, well, give us another condition. And they've got a 1,000 columns to choose from. So they sat down, they spoke to each other for like five minutes and came up with this condition. We put it into Impala and ran the query. And it comes back in three seconds. So they were like blown away. The, uh, the um, product manager looked over to the CTO and says, OK, so when can we have this? And then the salesman says, hey, you know, we at the moment, we only say that you only can get seven, five conditions. What if we say you can get 10 conditions, but it's going to cost you double? And if you want 20, it's going to cost you triple. And there's no difference on the infrastructure that they were using, and it was the same. So all of a sudden, the salesman actually got it before everyone else did, like, oh, I can make more money out of this. And it doesn't change. Now, the interesting thing was, if they went up to 40 conditions, and they did that on a regular basis, it actually may be better in this case to use Avro Deflate because the timing was the same. And if they went over 40, the time is still stayed the same. So a lot of it will depend on your use cases of what you want to pick on that one. So recommend, recommendation, recommended formats, uh, pretty much as you saw, a column of format when you're querying specific rows and not all of them is going to always be better. Uh, there is a sweet spot, um, and as um, Sylvia was showing, that sweet spot is actually moving. In the example that I had, the sweet spot was about 40 columns. In the other ones, it actually goes up to about 60 or 80. And so in some cases, it's like, why am I using any other format rather than a columnar format? And obviously, if you want schema evolution, then you have Avro, but then you take the hit on query time. So with that, I'm going to talk about uh, schema evolution now. Um, so what is schema evolution? What data formats evolve? Examples, use cases. And the other thing I've added on here is migrating from one data format to another, which has actually come up a few times when a client goes, well, if I get myself into Avro or Parquet and a new format comes along, how easy is it for me to migrate from one format to another? So schema evolution, it's adding columns, renaming columns, or removing columns, and why do I need it? So um, I originally started off in the UK, and I would, get, I would work in for some microsystems. I get schemas coming over from the US, and they have the address. It'd be street address, city, state with two characters. We don't really have that. And then they have zip code, which is basically an integer, and it's only five long. Of course, in the UK, a postal, co a postal code is, is about nine, and it's alphanumeric. So one of the things I would do all the time when I get a schema coming over from the US, I'm an Oracle developer, I'd have to go and change that schema to say, like, actually, we don't have zip code. Let's call it postal code and make it a varchar, make it probably about 10. 
I went and remember looking at like, okay, what does the rest of the world have? So we'd have to do a schema evolution. And if I'm doing that with a really large data set in production, that can actually change how my queries will, will perform because I'm going from an integer to a, to a string and the actual time it takes to actually do it. Oracle was pretty good at doing that. If I was in MySQL doing that and I had a really large data set, it actually has to rewrite the table and that may not be possible because that table then is offline for read or write access. So schema evolution to me was very important. So formats that I can involve, Avro is the one that is the quote unquote gold standard of schema evolution and I'll show you an example of that shortly. ORC has some changes in uh, 2.1 which we have a changing column type. So I can change a column type from an integer to a number and I can either delete or reorder columns as well, which may or may not be useful. I'm not a big one of deleting stuff, but some people are. Um, Parquet at the moment can only add columns to the end. And if Julian was in the room, he could correct me. But at the moment is, you've also got to make sure in what order you're adding those columns. Because if I add one column and then someone adds another column to a different file, even though we've got different column names, it still has the same index address. So if you're looking for that column and you've got your schema saying, hey, you know, um, column C is in position three, on one file it's in position three, but it's in position four in another file, I'm not going to get the one in the other file because it is doing it by index, but not by name, which actually ORC changed. I remember having a long discussion with Owen about that. I've yet to have it with Julian. I'm sure I will at some point. So here's my Avro example. I'm a, I'm a Doctor Who fan. Probably the original Doctor Who than the new Doctor Who. Um, this is a data set that came from The Guardian uh, in 2010 about Doctor Who's and time travel information is beautiful. It's kind of, it was fun. It took me down memory lane. But this is the Avro format, that I'm, the schema I'm going to use. This is just defining the schema. This is an Avro schema for Doctor Who. This is the data for Doctor Who. Um, I was a big John Pertwee Doctor Who fan. I age myself, so anyone else in the room who knows who John Pertwee is, you're probably in the same age as me. And this is some data that came from that, um, from that particular one. This is the original Doctor Who. So let's example, I want to add, rename, and delete some columns. So what I'm doing here is I'm gonna change the Doctor Who session or change it to Doctor Who session rather than Doctor underscore who underscore session. So it's aliased and the same with Doctor Who actor. And I'm going to get rid of estimated as a column. And I'm going to add a new column because we're in the, the new Doctor Who is we've got high definition. But the default is no. So anyone who doesn't have it, the default is no. So what we've done here is the table, the columns have changed and it's still pulling the same data. And I've added HD, so the new file had HD, the old file doesn't, so it's going to show no on those. And this is the same, so I had an original data format file, and I have the new one, and I basically put them in the same directory for Hive to query, and I got these results. So basically, our schema evolution on data that's already been there, so I don't have to go rewrite that information, which is kind of cool. And I'm sure I'm getting the five minutes, and we're going to be up in a minute, so I apologize. So the use case of this is, data added to a, an event stream, so things may be changing all the time. I've got to be able to schema, I've got to uh, evolve my schema while new data is coming in, which is what Sylvia was talking about. Need to see historic data with new data when it's changed, uh, my Doctor Who example. Updated field column names based on the evolving business. The business has changed the column name. You've got to change it. The new data is coming in with that new column name. So I'm going to quickly go through this. This is basically migrating from one format to another. So I'm basically taking a text file, which is S1, and making it into, hey, I'm going to create a data, a table called S1 Avro. I'm selecting it from S1. I'm telling it I'm using it as Avro. I'm compressioning Snappy. The same for ORC, the same for Parquet. So it's very easy to move from one data, one data format to another. The other thing to note on here, we've been burn a couple of times now. Um, make sure you always test to make sure the data files are compressed. So even though it may say it's snappy compression in the file name, make sure it's really snappy compression. And there's ways of checking that. 
Um, and this is the Spark example for the same thing. Um, it's basically just rewriting the format as um, either Parquet, in this case, Avro, or ORC. And some storage choices, just running for time. So what are the different storage choices? Right, we can either do a plain old file system, so basically disks that are actually on my, on my node. I can have a distributed file system like HDFS, or I can have a block object store, mainly probably an object store in either S3, uh, Azure, Google, or Ceph from Red Hat. Then the, the other question is, where is your data center? Is it on-prem? Is it in the cloud? Is it public or private? The reasons for choosing um, these different data stores, um, we've seen it with a couple of customers now that they want to spin up a ephemeral Hadoop clusters, but they don't want to keep copying the They don't want to keep necessarily always copy the data from one HDFS cluster to another HDFS cluster. They want to basically pull that data, hydrate those clusters in some cases from a common object store, S3, Azure's Blob, Google's, or Ceph, and then be able to actually increase their number of uh, nodes coming up. So for instance, if you've got a data science team that has some workloads, they may spin up a cluster, pull the data from the object store, do work on it, and then set the results down again. The other thing as well, and don't know if we have any of our distro friends in the room, it limits your licensing cost when your storage in, is, is increasing. So we've had clients that's gone, hey, we have a, a 300 node Cloudera cluster. We have more data than we can put in the cluster. We don't really want to add more nodes to pay Cloudera more money because we don't need the compute. We just need the storage. And this is definitely a way of looking at it as well. And I just talked about why you want these different needs. So with that, and I'm sorry I'm running over time, any questions? <laughs>